Today, we are going to be talking about Hydra's fine art watercolor. Let me hold it up. I can never remember if I'm talking to the camera or if I'm talking to this one. Um, and what this is and what it isn't and how you use it. And um, I want to talk about initially what it is. Liquid watercolor, many people consider to be ink or dye. It, and most liquid watercolor is dye-based, which means it is not watercolor. So when you go out to order liquid watercolor, if you don't read the description, what you get may be something other than um, watercolor and not something that you really want to be using in a watercolor role. But there are, as far as I know, about two exceptions to that. I would, about two months ago, I would have said only one. And one of them is Dr. P.H. Martin's Hydra's fine, fine Art Watercolor. This is pigment-based, just like tube paint and pan paint. Um, Dr. P.H. Martins also makes a, a, a watercolor paint, that what they call radiant concentrated watercolor. This is not pigment-based. It is not watercolor. It is dye. The colors are brilliant. I mean, they are absolutely stunning colors, but they are not light fast, and they don't really work the way watercolor does. But this is pigment-based. It's made out of the same pigment that tube and pan paints are made from. It's highly light fast. And some of the uh, formulas that we'll be looking at at Paints Today are specifically made to be light fast, in some cases, even more light fast than their equivalent would be in tube or pan paint. They're archival and they are ready to use. You can use them straight out of the bottle or you can um, dilute them with water and make washes and, and um, things like that. They're nice because they come with this little eyedropper. So you just drop your paint um, just drop your paint in to your palette. Now, I only put one drop in there. I'm going to be really generous and put two. And you're going to say, that's not really enough paint to do anything with. Well, I can tell you when we are through, I will still have paint left over. So, um, so again, we're going to be using three primaries today. I wanted to show you how colors mix and how they go together. So I used primaries. I tried to use just warm primaries. So I'm using permanent red. Hydrus, um, a Hansa yellow medium. I was saying Hydrus didn't sound right. And ultramarine. And I chose those three because I wanted to stick with primaries. Um, and I, but I also want to do some pigment comparisons and some discussions about color and what color means. And so I tried to find colors that are comparable to tube paint colors that you might commonly use. Most of my comparisons are going to be between Daniel Smith and P.H. Martin, uh, Dr. P.H. Martin's. There's also another pigment-based liquid watercolor. As far as I know, there are only two that are pigment-based that are true watercolor. This one is made by Schmenka. It's new. Um, Schmenka just started making it, I'd say, in the last year, and it's only just become readily available in the U.S. Uh, probably... Uh, it's probably been available in the last, during the last year, but maybe people are just becoming aware of it during uh, the last few months. Um, it's very similar to um, P.H. Martin's in terms of its composition. They, it has a nice dropper that you use as well. It's extremely concentrated. I don't like the dropper quite as well as this one as I do in um, Dr. P.H. Martin's, but that's because it's flat on the bottom. I don't particularly care for that, but that's just me. Um, if I were going to buy uh, Dr. P.H. Martin's, the half ounce bottles come in sets. There are three sets of different color combinations for a total of 36 colors. Most of the colors are not colors you necessarily are going to want. So if you're interested in using this and you have not already purchased the sets, I would probably purchase the individual bottles. They're bigger. That's not necessarily an advantage because this is concentrated, but I would choose maybe three warm primaries and three cool primaries and then whatever ever other colors you want to mix together because you technically can make everything with those colors. Uh, the one ounce bottles are glass. The half ounce bottles are plastic. So if you do a lot of plain air painting and you want to carry tubes with you that you don't have to worry about breaking, that you only have to worry about leaking, uh, then this is probably a good bet for you. So what do I have here? I have um, a hibiscus that I'm painting. This is not a class about painting a hibiscus. 
If I were going to paint a hibiscus, this wouldn't be it. But here it is. Here's the picture that I was painting from. It's just a plain, simple hibiscus. And I didn't put any of the leaves or anything into the background because I just wanted us to focus on the colors and how they work together. And you can see I have painted all of the hibiscus with the first coat of paint, except for this one petal and each one of these. Now, if you like to paint cards, for instance, you like to make cards for your family and you're using not cold press, but hot press, um, this paint is going to behave differently on it than it does on cold press, as it would both out of a tube or out of a pan. But let's look at something else that's different about this. These are both Daniel Smith Ultramarine. These are both P.H. Martin's Ultramarine. Um, you can see they aren't the same color. So that's the first thing that you would, you would wonder about why if the name of this paint is ultramarine, and if ultramarine is PB29, why aren't these the same color? You can see these are basically the same color. This mm -hmm. is Daniel Smith ultramarine. This is Daniel Smith ultramarine. The only thing that's different is the, the surface. This is a hot press. This is cold press. Uh, there's more tooth in this paper, so you get more variation in your paint. Let me also say I would never paint a background just ultramarine blue. This is for the purpose of this discussion. You just wouldn't do that. But we'll try to go back at the end and see if we can make some adjustments to the background. But for the moment, I wanted you to see paint comparisons. And you can see that for Dr. P.H. Martin's, this color on cold press is uh, much darker. Um, this is cold, I'm sorry, hot press. <laughs> hot press is much darker cold press is lighter, but neither of them are the same color as the ultramarine over here. And we're gonna make sure that that's right. I'm going to stick my brush into some ultramarine. I'm gonna put some paint up here, a little water. This is Daniel Smith ultramarine, okay? Looks very much like this color down here, doesn't it? It granulates, and remember I told you that uh, these colors do not granulate. But if I'm going to put in Daniel Smith, I mean, P.H. Martin, helps if you choose ultramarine and not green. You can see they are not the same color. And they're not the same color because P.H. Martin doesn't use PB29. Um, French ultramarine and less of a typical ultramarine. So you can see this isn't just a function of how I painted this particular day. You can see that these colors are actually different. Now, why would P.H. Martin's not use PB29? Because it's granulating. And again, these don't granulate. Um, they're liquid. They're not in a format where a granulating paint is really going to work all that well. Can you make them granulate? Sure. Uh, Schmincke makes this nice product called um, granulating medium. So you can make any paint granulate if you want to. If you don't like granulating, then obviously you wouldn't do it. And there are times when I want something to granulate especially like it in backgrounds, but I don't want it one solid color. So if I were actually painting this and I was going to use ultramarine in the background, I would be mixing it with some other colors. And I especially would have put in some leaves and things like that. I'd be putting in some green. We might lift out a little bit before we threw if we have time and see what happens. So any questions about these backgrounds and why they're different? So let's go to our reds. Now here's what I did with the, um, if I do, I I'm, I'm off the table. Okay, I wanted to be able to see the differences in, I'm about to paint down there too, so. Okay, all right, so Hansa, Hansa me Yellow Medium. We're going to go right there. There's the Daniel Smith.
Here's the pH Martins. You can see they're both the same pigment. They're both very similar in color. This is, this is not diluted. This has had some water put into it. This has only had a, had a little bit. So. so you can see they're very similar. We're gonna go to, and before we move on, we're gonna paint this petal down here and let it start drying. Actually, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I'd done my red first. I'm painting with Daniel Smith, Hansa Yellow, Medium, on 300 pound cold press. And again, my goal in this is not to create a fabulous hibiscus, it's to show you how this paint works. And I mixed it with permanent red. So here's my permanent red going right over. And there goes the camera. Where'd it go? Okay. So there's my permanent red going right over my wet yellow, which is what I want it to do because this is a color that I really like. I like this combination. Um, so let's see what happens on the other side. Now I'm going to do the same thing with pH Martins. I'm going to put on my clean my brush just a little bit more so we're not getting the contamination. And because these are so dense, if you want the paint to move, you have to add a little bit more water than you might otherwise have added. Um, and those of you who have had classes with me know that I like to put the paint down and then move it with water that I don't Sometimes I put the, um, put the paint on. And this is uh, permanent red with PH Martins. Does this uh, liquid also dry 30% lighter than the color you see when it's wet? Um, not really. These do not dry that much lighter. Um, these can. I mean, depending on the amount of water that you put in. Those of you who take classes with me know that I also like really intense colors, so I go kind of light on the water um, because I like my colors to stay really bright. You can see... Um, if, if there's a difference in these in terms of color, other than the background, is that I think this looks a little smoother. Can you zoom in a little bit so that they can see a little bit more in terms of how it's moving on the paper? Now, this is we've removed the function of paper from this because this is 300 pound cold press, and you can see that it's a little smoother look. Does that, does that make sense? It's yes. a very dense paint. So if I want variation in the paint, I'm going to do it by lifting out later on. I'm going to be doing it. You can see I've already added some lines and things in here. I'm going to be doing all of that after this dries. Now, the advantage is it dries really fast. So how do these look, in, these two paints look in comparison up here? Let's go back and continue our little comparison. There's my permanent red. There's my permanent red out of the... Um, and here's my Daniel's, my PH Martin's permanent red. And again, not a lot of difference in color. And that's because the pigments are, are very, very similar. So the one place where the pigments aren't similar is here in this blue. And you see the difference that there's actually a color change in these two, while, while these generally are staying pretty much the same. Um, one thing about the... Okay, one thing about the um, pH Martins is if you don't dilute them with water much, you don't get much, you don't get much loss of color. So somebody asked about the 30% loss, you don't really get that because it's um, so that because they're so concentrated. On the other hand, if you're not using a lot of water, and, and I wasn't, this is regular watercolor paint. And you can see I don't have a lot of loss of color there either because I didn't put a lot of water down. 
Now, let's go down here and paint these leaves on the hot press. I don't like hot press paint, okay? I mean, paper. I just don't. It's like, I don't know. It's just too slicky. But I'm, I'm trying to be good and give it a fair shot. So, yes, yeah, Artistico. Um, yeah, I see the watermark. I couldn't read the watermark. It's Artistico 300 hot press. So I've put down my Hansi Yellow Light, and you can see that this is a, a much smoother surface. I, I don't know how many of you have painted on hot press. Anybody painted on hot press? I don't see anybody raising their hand. I'm not encouraging to jump in there and paint on hot press. because, Like I said, I don't like it. I know, I know one person who's watching has some hot press they don't know what to do with. So um, maybe they'll <laughs> you accidentally buy hot press, you know. Let me tell you something. You just go buy cardstock. It's a whole lot easier. Um, so there I've painted that with Daniel Smith. And now I'm going to go back with my permanent red, just like I did above. Hot press, it sits right on the top of the paper. And it's... Um, um, streakier that's the only word I really know to use it doesn't it doesn't soak into the paper it just stays up there on the top um, and that makes it puddle in strange ways which is why over here we have these puddles from um, pH Martins um, it, it just it I don't know how to describe what it does it's just the paint just lies there and if you know it just doesn't it doesn't move the way you expect watercolor to move. But if you like hot press, if you do a lot of illustrations uh, or you want something that looks more like an illustration than a watercolor painting, then hot press is a really good choice. I mean, see, that's, that's not unattractive. I'm not suggesting it is. It's just not what I want in my watercolor paper. So let's go over here and do the same thing with um, PH Martins. There's our in our brush. It doesn't really matter because we're mixing our paint, but that isn't exactly, and it is exactly the same way. It sits right on top of the paper, right on top, so that you kind of have to smear it around. I don't know how else to describe it. I always feel like I'm not really painting when I'm on a hard press. I'm just trying to get the paint to move into some areas where I actually want it to go. And then I'm going to go back with my Okay, so let's see if we can see what our differences are here. We've got all of this paint is dry except for the ones we just painted. Um, there's the difference, if you were here with me, the differences that I can see are these backgrounds look very different to me in terms because of the color of the paint. Um, and there's a smoother texture to the PH Martins. Remember, it's not granulating. Um, it's a, a much smoother pigmented paint. So as this dries, I'm going to be coming back and putting in my shadows, doing whatever it is I need to do to make this watercolor flower have this hibiscus flower have some dimension. And again, if it were a real painting, I'd have leaves in the background and I'd be doing all sorts of things, which is not the purpose of this. So that's how it goes on the paper. Any questions about that right now? Let me show you sap green before we move on, and then I'm going to be mingling some colors to show you how they work together. Okay, so sap green, I have um, Daniel Smith's sap green. Let's put it right there. This is almost a meaningless activity because I've already showed you every manufacturer's sap green is different. There it is. P.H. Martin sap green. And you can see it is a slightly different shade, but not dramatically different. So while that's wet, suppose I wanted to, this is Daniel Smith. Suppose I wanted to mingle a PH Martin color in it. Suppose I wanted to add some yellow. I just drop it in 
And because this is heavier, if you can drop it in when it's really wet. Yellow is a good color, but I'm not really getting a good picture of that. Yellow is a good color for pushing. Um, its chemical composition causes it to push through other paint a little harder than some other colors. And because PH Martins is denser than in is uh, tube paint, it will push harder. So you interesting effect when you're dropping it into wet paint. You can see what's happening here with my uh, sap green from Daniel Smith with the PH Martin's what yellow. You can see how hard it's pushing this color kind of out of the way. So when that dries, I'm going to have some really interesting variations in the color. That is one of the nice things about using these in conjunction with traditional watercolor. They will push harder through the wet paint uh, than the traditional watercolor will do. So put I put, I put, if, if you put yellow on the sap green hydrus, would it do the same? No, it'll do it. It'll make it lighter but you can see it isn't pushing quite the same way. This, this is traditional watercolor paint on top of the hydrus. This is hydrus on top of the traditional. The yellow is denser. It's gonna push harder on the traditional paint than the traditional paint would on the hydrus because the hydrus is denser. Does that make sense? How hard can it push through the water? And hydrus can push harder because it's denser. So we're gonna do a little bit more color mixing in just a minute. Any questions about that before I move on? Oh uh, yeah, unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, no questions, so we're gonna move on. So I'm gonna put this aside. Um, when it dries just a little bit, we'll come back and I wanna show you what you can do with neutral tint for both of these. But over here, you know, actually I wanna do it on this one. I'm gonna do color mingling on cold press, just because that's more typical of what we're going to be doing than to do it on hot press. I was going to do it on hot press, but we won't. So how do these, do these colors mingle? I'm going to get a bigger brush. And because I'm using a bigger brush, I'm going to add another drop of paint here just because I want to. I'm going to use my vermilion hue this time. So I'm going to wet this little square here. Yeah, zoom in on that. I'm going to take my Hansa yellow, put it right here. You have already seen that this mingles because I did it on the hibiscus. And I'm going to take my, this is all hydras. Now, if I want it to mingle a little bit more than that, because it's fairly dense paint, I might have to add a little bit of water. Just drop some water in. And you can see that it's mingling just the way you would expect it to mingle if you were using traditional Daniel Smith. Here we're going to go right here. I forgot to wet my paper. And I'm going to take my permanent red. This is all Daniel Smith. This is 300 pound paper. So if I let it sit, you know, it's going to keep it's going to take a little bit of time to dry. Let's increase the water there just so it'll blend a little bit better. Yeah. So you can see this is mingling just like it would if it were, if, if it's Daniel Smith, it's traditional watercolor, it's going to blend just the way that you might want it to. So suppose we wanted to make our own green. Suppose we did not want to use, um, I keep forgetting to, keep forgetting to wet my brush before I do this. 
I just put a lot of yellow out there. So I'm gonna wet this square up here and I wanna make my own green. Is it raining? What is that sound I'm hearing? Okay, so here is PH Martin, Hansi Yellow Medium, and I want some of my ultramarine. So what happens if we put it together? And you can see how strong this is. I've got more water on this brush because it's a bigger brush and it is picking up a lot of paint. So I wouldn't want it to be that green. So let's just run it down and see what happens. May have to go to my other paper just because I don't have a choice. I'm holding it up so it'll run in case you guys wonder what I'm doing. And you can see as it runs, it's going to produce a, a color that is um, somewhere close to the green that I want. But this, that's the other thing I want to point out about this. This is really, really intense paint. So I'm going to put this aside for a moment. I'm going to use this little tiny piece of paper here. I'm going to put, this is 140 cold press. It is rain out there. Hard rain. Hard rain yeah. Like we need it. This is hydrous. And you can see with that one dip in the, um, in the, into the drop, I was able to that whole section with much loss of color. Now let's see what happens when we do that with Daniel Smith over here. And you can see, I've got to go back two or three times to get the same level of color in my Daniel Smith. So when people ask, sometimes people will say one of the things about this is that it's expensive. It really isn't because I don't, I don't know if you can see this too, but I've been using this yellow for a long time and I have probably seven eighths of a bottle left. So, and you can see this is going to dry lighter too, even though they're very similar colors, I need to go back more times to get the same level of intensity. Now, if you're not into intense color like I am, you may not care, but that's what I love about these is I can get that intense color really quickly and with a lot less paint. And if you really like intense color, this is a good way to get it. Now, you also have to be a little careful with it. They're, the colors are so lovely and they're so intense that you can end up with a painting that really is kind of in your face. When I did some tomatoes one day and I was so fascinated by the colors I was producing that I just was, you know, playing with my tomatoes. And um, I ended up with something that looked a lot like you'd probably have to be on something when you were buying them for them to actually appear that color. They were so intense. So um, now the nice thing about PH Martin when you are painting is they do dry very quickly. This isn't dry yet, but it's more dry than this. You can see when I put my finger in this, this is still very wet. This is beginning to be... Um, pretty dry. So if I wanted to mingle with it, I got to get in there pretty fast before it dries or I'll not end up with it mingling the way that I want it to. So we're down to our last 15 minutes and I have some other things I want to show you guys. First of all, I want to, people always say, well, can you lift out on these things? So let's put this aside. You can see how bright and beautiful that color is. I did a, a, a I guess you would, I called it jungle madness for lack of a better word, but it was, you know, really vibrant leaves out in the jungle. And I used a combination of vermilion hue and one of these colors called um, quinacridone red violet. And oh, it produced this just fabulous color combination where when I did the dark color purple in and the lighter color red out, made these fabulous, fabulous, really vivid colors. And then I used my traditional watercolors 
in the background to have more muted background. I didn't really want vivid color back there. I wanted it more muted. And um, so it allowed me to um, create this, this really beautiful plant that kind of jumped out at you. Um, what's good or bad? You know, I always tell people if they have, if they have things to say about my paintings, good or bad, it's usually about the color that either too vivid or, you know, frightening. I don't know, but <laughs> okay. So if I wanted to lift this out, do, does this paint lift the same way that it would if it were traditional watercolor? Well, I have here my little silver scrubber. I love this little silver scrubbers. I don't, I don't know if you've used any of the silver scrubbers. They're so good. They're also my dog's favorite brush. So if he can get hold of something, if she can get hold of something to chew on, she always chooses my scrubber for some reason. So I keep having to make sure she can't get to them, first of all. And secondly, that um, I can order some more. Now, if I want to lift down, I'm going to go over here. This is my PH Martins. I've got I've wet it a little bit. I've got my scrubber. I'm going to try to go in the same direction so I don't mess up my paper. That's the nice thing about 300 paper. You can, can kind of beat the crap out of it and it not be quite so bad as when you're working with 140. Um, and you can see that that is lifting out, or maybe you can't, but I hope you can. Can you zoom in so they can see that I'm lifting out a line here? So you can see that it is beginning to lift out the way that I want it to. Now, is that harder than over here? Yes, it is. Because this paint is more intense, it's more concentrated, it is a little harder to lift out. That doesn't mean it won't lift out, it just means that it isn't going to lift out quite as easily as it might. And again, that's dependent to some extent on color. If it's staining, um, it's going to um, um, be harder to lift out whether you're working on with the traditional tube paint or you're working with PH Martins. So if I wanted to lift out down here on this, this sap green stem, green almost always lifts better than and you can see that that lifted a little more easily. But it's also going to lift more easily over here too. So lifting is one of those situations where it's just a little bit harder because the paint is more dense. So what if I wanted to darken up my um, leaf, uh, my leaf, my petals, but I didn't want to change color. And that's one of the things I was thinking about with you guys. If I didn't want to change color, what would I use? Well, I use something called neutral tint. And this is Daniel Smith neutral. Almost everything I use is Daniel Smith. This is Daniel Smith neutral tint. Um, I just put like 50,000 more dabs of neutral tint than I would ever need in a million years. You don't need that much. Um, but what neutral tint does is create a darker color of the same hue. So it doesn't change the hue of the paint. It just makes it darker. Now, if you have, like I do, 14 tubes of red paint, you don't probably have to do that. You can just pick a different color. But since I wanted us to stay consistent, one of the things that I found is that I can use neutral tint with PH Martin. It doesn't have a neutral tint that comes with it. I tried using Payne's Gray, which does come with it. It doesn't work. It creates a um, kind of brownish color that I didn't care for. I didn't want that. I wanted to keep my nice glowing dark color. So if I take this very minute little amount of... Um, neutral tint right here. And I take my pH Martins and mix with it. I can actually do a little bit darker than that. I'm going to get a darker red that is still the same hue as this color here. So I could come in and begin to darken up some of my shadow areas with a darker color that is going to hold on to the same kind of color, the same range of color as my petals are at the moment. So And if I didn't want it that dark, I'd put a little more red into it and just lighten it up. So you can use neutral tint, which is your traditional tube paint, to actually darken your colors here 
and begin to get a little bit more of your shadow. So that's one of the ways to overcome the fact that there are only 36 of those colors. But on the other hand, as I've said, I don't know that you would use it in place of your traditionals. You'd only use it in addition to. But painting on cradle board has gotten to be really popular. Um, now this is a traditional cradle board painting. I painted it on, um, let me put it right here. We'll do these in order. I painted this on a uh, 140 pound cold press with traditional watercolor paint. I, you know, I glued it to my board. Here's my cradle board. I went through my bookshelf to try to find books. You know, you, you can't weight things down with Kindles any longer. So you have to still have some books available, trying to find books big enough to, you know, put the glue this down press it down, press it down for 24 hours, hope I haven't glued it to the table in the process, um, pull it up, hope that it's all stuck down the way it's supposed to, put my stuff on it, then put my, this one's got Dolan wax medium on it. So this is, when you watch a video about how to do a cradle painting, this is very traditionally done. It's done on paper, it's glued to the board, it's spray painted with an archival spray, it's covered with Dolan wax medium, and, and it, it looks lovely, I like it. But it's a lot of work. Now, Cradle board in general is a lot of work. So it's, this doesn't say that. This, on the other hand, is pH Martin fluid watercolor. It's not the same, um, it's not the same hibiscus we were painting over there. This is a peach one. Um, I have a message in my screen, so I hope they don't, don't see that. But um, it says uh, clean my PD, clean up my PC. <laughs> it's telling me to declutter my PC. Uh, this is painted on with PH Martin Hydrus watercolor on cradle board that's been painted with watercolor ground. Watercolor ground is this really thick stuff that um, comes in a, uh, and again, it's Daniel Smith. You can see it's not, Daniel Smith's not the only one that makes it. I just buy everything Daniel Smith because I like Daniel Smith. This is watercolor ground. I'm going to tell you it's ground up watercolor paper, but it's, it's a paste that when dried simulates watercolor paper. So you just paint it on. You can see I've got a nice whiteboard here. Um, it needs to cure for, they say 24 to 72 hours, but it really needs to cure for about 48 for it to paint the way you want it to. And then it paints like watercolor paper. So I don't have to, and this doesn't have anything to do with PH Martins. You can paint with any kind of watercolor on this. Um, so now I'm ready to put my painting on this and paint it. Now, the nice thing about this is if, when I did this one with the paper and all of that, if I had screwed this up somewhere along the way, everything's lost. My board, my painting, it's all lost. If it buckled up in the middle or, you know, curled on the edges or all the things that happens with these, it's just lost. I have to throw it away. I have one like that right now that I just need to throw in the garbage. With this one, because it's painted directly on the board, if this had turned out to be a disaster before I put the top coat on it, I would just have gotten my watercolor ground out and I would have painted right over it. And I now had a new, have a new surface to paint on. So you don't, I mean, you know, I guess if you had to do this 10 or 15 times, you'd end up with such a thick coat of watercolor ground that it wouldn't be useful. But generally, if you mess it up, you can um, just paint over it with your watercolor ground, let it, before you seal it, let it dry and then and repaint it. You haven't lost your board. If the painting was terrible, it doesn't matter that you've lost the painting because you're going to lose it anyway. Um, and, and it creates a really nice surface. This does not have Dolan watercolor wax medium on it. This has a semi-gloss top coat on it. So I sprayed it with archival spray and then painted it with the semi-gloss top, semi top coat. Um, and I, I think it looks pretty nice. I was pretty happy with it. I was trying to produce a, a cradle board that only used fluid watercolor, that did not use anything other than fluid watercolor, so that I could show you it was possible to have a lot of variation in your painting 
use, even though I usually use it in combination with traditional paint, it's possible to use it in isolation and create the same kind of um, um, different color mixes that you would like to have. And here's one that's in progress. Um, and this is a class I was supposed to teach today and we ended up not being able to, to, to teach it, but I decided to go ahead and get started with my papaya and paint it on, on cradle board with PH Martins. It hasn't been treated yet. It hasn't been finished. Uh, it still has a lot of detail to go in, but you can see you get the really bright colors and the, the really pretty, um, all the shadowing and shading that you would like to have with uh, your painting, even with just using the fluid watercolor without using traditional watercolor at all. But again, my favorite way to use them is in combination with traditional watercolor. I like to use the traditional watercolor and then use the, the hydras to highlight or use in particular color combinations that really make things pop out. So um, put these all back over there. May I ask another question? When you're yes. talking about cradle board, was that just the beige board and you painted it white or did you buy the one that's cradle board that's gessoed on the front and then you nope, put just plain old cradle board plain cradle board that you get on sale at michael's and i painted the watercolor ground right on top of it just paint it on you don't have to treat it in any way whatsoever sometimes they'll say rough it up if you want it to really stick but but this board is 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 not an issue you really kind of want it to be smooth i guess if you were painting on a stone or something like that you might have a little bit more trouble but you can put this stuff on anything plastic stones you know, I don't know, glasses, I, I, you wouldn't be able to wash them, but <laughs> Gwen, <laughs> you didn't mind that, that would be. <laughs> Gwen? Yes. I've got another yes. question and you might've just, I've got two more, but you might've answered one of them. I'm, I've got all these canvases, you know, I was painting in acrylics for a while, no, I'm not. Right. And can I put watercolor ground on those canvases? Yes, you can. Okay, that's good. And then the yep. other one is you talked about mixing the hydrous colors and the fact that you don't use very much of it. So right. say you need three drops of yellow and two drops of red to make the color you want. Then you've got five drops out there. Can you re-wet them later and use them again? Yep. I I'd normally, this little tray right here, I normally, and it looks, there, looks like there's almost no paint in it. Um, I won't wash it. Tomorrow, okay. when I sit down to paint my ultramarine, I'll just rehydrate it with a little bit of water. I won't even put water in it. I'll wet my brush, just wet my okay. brush and, you know, go back into it. It rehydrates just fine. Now, okay. when you're rehydrating, you have diluted it a little bit with water. So it's not going to have quite the same intense color that it might have had when you first started, but it'll still be, it'll still be intense. In fact, I have a, I call it my T90 brush. It's like a two. And when I'm wanting to do really fine detail, I, I use my two and I just touch it into my paint and um, use it full strength, you know, just into the water, maybe put a line of color on my watercolor painting, touch this in and then let it, let it move itself into the, uh, into the watercolor painting. And it's so intense that you don't have to move it along very much. So, and, and you know, because you see my work, I like, I like color. It, you know, it's always going to be really bright uh, just because that's, that's what I enjoy. And one other thing about this, this is extremely slow to dry. Uh, the paint on it is extremely slow to dry. So if I, if I were doing this one, and in fact, when I was doing this one, I might paint my papaya, these colors, and then go over here and paint my bananas. And I would probably give, I wouldn't let any color touch until probably a couple of hours of drying. Um, okay. The hydras dries faster on watercolor ground than does traditional watercolor, but they're really slow to dry. And it's it's okay. just the nature of this watercolor ground being on board that um, makes it a little slower to dry, but it, it does okay. dry and it dries pretty. Okay, we are at the end, in fact, past the end of our hour. Any other questions? <laughs>